Good day, beautiful people, and welcome back to my podcast, Life Treasures and Golden Moments. This is Natalie Silva. I hope everybody's doing well out there today, and uh, today is the last day of March, March 31st, 2023. Today, I would like to uh, share some stories as to how miracles come to us in different ways. Let's begin on how miracles appear through nature and animals. Have you ever given thought to things that happen in our lives? Some people would describe them as a miracle, or it was just a coincidence, or if I hadn't been running late, if I'd been just five minutes later or earlier, it was perfect timing, etc., etc., A coincidence just might be God's intervention. The following stories are examples of such. Sometimes God will use his power through animals and nature to perform miracles in the lives of people. The first story I'd like to share with you today is authored by Cynthia Laird and is called Goodbye Bluebird. How do you say goodbye to those who meant the world to you and gave you the childhood you otherwise wouldn't have had? Slowly. My grandparents were my lifeline. They gave me hope when I had none. They gave me unconditional love that I didn't receive in my own house. They gave me great strength, pearls of wisdom I still hold dear, and the stability I craved when I was young. Most importantly, they gave me the strength and courage to become who I wanted to be. They were truly my angels on earth. They both lived long, productive lives, but that doesn't take away the pain of losing them. Grandma died of Alzheimer's and Grandpa passed on two years later after a stroke. Tiny pieces of my heart went with them, and I didn't know how to make repairs. I couldn't even visit their graves for a long time after their deaths. Grandma had slowed down quite a bit before she passed, but we always had our afternoon tea together. I go to her house every afternoon for tea and biscuits and to hear her amazing adventures of her youth, even on the days when she couldn't organize her thoughts. Grandpa was still active until that day of his stroke. Our thing was watching birds. Look at that one, he'd say one afternoon. That's a bluebird. They say those bluebirds are signs of good luck and often have the spirit of a loved one who has gone. Someone that has gone on, but is still looking out for you. Really, I asked, how do you know? Oh, Grandpa has his ways of just knowing certain things. Well, who is that? Someone watching out for you. Grandpa was quiet for a while and then smiled. Yes, I believe so. He comes to see me every day. Will you be a bluebird for me, too? He looked at me, his blue eyes glowing in the sunlight. Grandpa was always be watching. I scrunched my face in a frown. But how will I know it's you? You'll know, darling. You'll just feel it. When the time came for me to leave for Winnipeg and move to Edmondson for a job opportunity, I decided to visit grandparents' graves to finally say goodbye. It took three tries before I could get near where they rested. The first time I had only made it to the gates and and had to leave. The second time I went into the information booth at the front of the cemetery to get a map to where my grandparents' graves were, and then I left again. Finally, a couple of weeks after, I took time off around my birthday and decided that visiting my grandparents was one of the things I was going to do that I had to do. I stopped at a flower shop to buy a purple lily and a holder. I went right up to the grave gravel road to where they rested, and I clutched the wrapped flowers in my fist, took a few deep breaths, then slowly got out of the vehicle. I tiptoed through the spongy green grass, apologizing to my grandparents' eternal neighbors as I tromped across them. I crept on until I came to a massive headstone in the middle of a short, crooked row, a lump lodged in my throat. I wanted to run my feet stood there on the ground. I heard my grandma's voice. Don't let fear feed you. Use it as a source of strength to keep you moving forward. 
The headstone was larger than I expected. The outside was gray, with shiny flecks that sparkled in the sun. The middle of the stone was polished black, head like shiny marble, with a name etched across in thick bold letters, Batty, B-A-T-T-Y, at the base of two nameplates, were my grandparents' full names, George Wilfred Batty and Lillian May Worth. Someone had planted pansies between their nameplates. A light breeze tickled the branches of the sturdy elm tree behind me, and it danced in time with the pansies. I knelt to be at eye level with the headstone. Then I traced the beautifully engraved letters with my fingertips. I'm sorry it took me so long to come, I said with a squeaky whisper. I'm sure you've been kept updated about what's going on. And even if Uncle Craig didn't tell you everything, I'm sure Grandma sent Grandpa out to make sure. I laughed weakly. With my fingers running out of letters, I fidgeted with the grass under the knees. I was so angry with both of you for leaving me alone. I never got to say goodbye or to thank you. It took every ounce of strength I had not to leave, letting all the feelings rise and be felt were the hardest thing I could ever do. I knew if I could make it through that moment, anything else I did would be okay, that I'd be okay. Thank you for giving me my childhood, for being there when I needed you, for letting me be kind. Thank you for saving me. Without your presence, I would never have had the strength to come this far. Warm streams trickled down my cheeks, and the breeze gently tossed my hair over my shoulders, like Grandma used to do whenever she wanted to see my face. I can't promise you I'll never mess up again, but like Grandma said, I'll take what I need and I'll let go of the rest. I'll never derail again. At least I'll try not to. I shoved a plastic flower holder in the middle of the dancing pansies and put the oversized purple lily inside it. I won't be back for a long time, but I know what Grandpa meant in the hospital, that you'll always be with me. I touched my head and my heart, then the headstone the same way Grandpa said goodbye to me. As I walked back to the vehicle, the aching emptiness I clung to for so long was finally filled with contentment, with love and happiness. I looked back one last time at the headstone and was surprised to see two glorious bluebirds perched on top of it. Bluebirds are rare in this area. They stared at me, and I didn't think it at all strange, but they watched me drive away. When I drove around the corner, I saw two blue streaks shoot up over the trees, circle, and then they flew off, and I smiled. Goodbye, Bluebird. Thank you to our author, Miss Ladd, for that beautiful story about her grandparents today and the Goodbye Bluebird. Very touching story. The next story I'd like to share is called Sweetie, and the author is Gary Hainine. It's a story about a dog and about someone that was in the service. About the gurgling spring and weepy cherry tree, I spread a shovel of dirt on the grave sh- that sheltered my precious dog, Lucy. Then I placed a big rock on top of it. That way, when I returned to my friend's farm, I could go straight to the place. When a man buries his heart, he wants to know where he can find it. Some folks say a man shouldn't get so attached to a dog. Certainly not an ex-Navy man like me. But they didn't know my Lucy. My wife, Collar, and I got Lucy as a pup, and we never did know what kind of dog she was. She was larger than a lab, with the biggest brown eyes you ever saw, and fuzzy white hair. When she weighed in the Green Bar River up in the West Virginia mountains, where we had a cabin, she looked like a big polar bear. That was all before the tumor on Lucy's leg. Now she was gone. Never again would we walk along the flood wall or go for rides in my van. Until the final beat of her heart, that dog was all mine. The last thing she did on earth was to look at me soulfully as if to say, I know you're taking good care of me, Gary. But ever since Lucy went to heaven, 
I didn't want to live anymore. That's another thing people didn't understand. I mean, a man doesn't have a more devoted wife than my Carla, and my daughter Ashley was the biggest and best teenager a father could hope for. Still, something deep inside of me snapped when Lucy took her last breath. All the memories of Vietnam that I had worked hard to hold back came crashing down to me when she died. I'd lie in bed and not even hear the TV playing. I was so far gone. I had to be reminded to shower and to eat. Not even Carla's Cajun pasta could lure me to the family dinner table. Carla, who worked at the Veterans Hospital, said she was sure my severe depression was due to the war. Please let me take you to the hospital and get you some help, she pleaded. I'll go when we get back from the fair. I finally agreed. Going to the West Virginia State Fair was an annual tradition for our family. I didn't know how I would endure it this year, though. For the past few weeks, all I had been able to do is to tell myself to breathe and to sit in my recliner by a big picture window and watch the trains roll by. What happened to the man who used to enjoy life, the one who took so much pleasure in his family and in helping people? Now the guy everyone once said was so generous could barely survive, let alone look out for his fellow man. Somehow I managed to drive the four-hour trek to Lewisburg, where the fair is held. We needed groceries for our cabin, so we went to the Walmart as soon as we got into town. At the entrance was a bulletin board with pictures of dogs the local pound had up for adoption. A dash and mix caught my eye. No. Make that spoke to my heart. If you'll take me in, I'll be the very best dog you ever did see, it seemed to say, all the way back to the cabin. I could not get that dog off my mind, neither could Carla. You need to call the pound, I told her. You need to call them, she encountered. Deep down, I longed for the unconditional love of a dog in my life again, but no one could replace Lucy. It was almost 5 p.m. when I finally made the call. Oh, you're talking about Sweetie? A lady with a kind voice said when I described the dog in the photograph. We close at 5 and we're way out in the country, the lady continued. But if you want to come and see her today, I'll stay open and wait for you. That's one special canine. She was so accommodating. There were almost an urgency about her. On this Tuesday evening, the Lewisburg Humane Society was deserted except for a lady with salt, pepper hair. Cages lined both sides of the dingy gray walls. Dogs of every description pressed their paws against the metal and howled a mournful, Look at me, unison, when they spotted a collar in me. All the dogs except for one, that is. A dog with the saddest face I'd ever seen. The mirror image of my own sad face, in fact. I nudged Carla. Look at that pitiful one, I said. Doesn't even have the whir or withdrawal to bark. About that time, the lady joined us. Oh, you're admiring our little sweetie, she said. That's what we call her around here. The lady's brown eyes dropped to the floor. That sweetie's a sad case. Someone dropped her off back in May because of a problem with her leg. But she's one of the older ones, and no one has taken her home. People say she looks like a pot belly pig. The lady spoke in a whisper, even though we were the only ones there. If Sweetie's not adopted by Thursday, I'm afraid we'll have to put her to sleep. I took a second longer look at the dog. She seemed so forlorn, as if she knew her days were numbered. Did you say Thursday? I managed to get out. That's the day after tomorrow. Suddenly, Sweetie became more coveted than vintage Lamgur's porcelain. We'll take her. We'll take her. Carla and I sang in unison as the woman circled us in a grateful hug. As we drove up to the West Virginia State Fair, all I could think about was having a dog in my life again. When Carla and I approached the animal stalls and caught sight of caretakers grooming the sheep, Carla said, Just think, Gary. When we get home, we can brush Sweetie's coat. Won't that be great? But depression was already getting in a, its hold on me again. Not even then, the baked steak and peas and corn at the cafeteria could cheer me up. 
And seeing Ashley ride the Ferris wheel didn't make me smile either. I forced myself to go with Carla to see Allison across and Union Station perform. But my heart wasn't even in good bluegrass music. I could tell Carla was worried, but I couldn't help myself. I was sinking deeper and deeper into despair. When we get home, I'll see the therapist at the VA, I promised. Back at our cabin, Sweetie didn't demand a single thing of me. When Carla and I went to bed for the evening, Sweetie found a comfortable spot at the side of my bed, and I began to stroke her ears. I'm glad you came home with us, I told her. And then in the silent language between dog and master, I added, I need you. Sweetie planted a big old slobbery kiss on my hand and stayed right there, right there for all the rest of the night. Once at home, I kept my promise to Carla about seeing the therapist at the VA hospital. Jim was his name. He was delighted that I had found myself a good dog. I can't bottle up what a pet will do for you. Mr. Haney, he said, I just want you to take good care of that sweetie. The minute we got home from the VA, I retreated to my recliner, but Carla would have none of it. She handed me sweetie's lease. The two of you need to get out of the house, she said. So we took a nice little walk past the train. It felt refreshing to get exercise and even lifted my depression a little. In the ensuing days, I learned that Sweetie loved hot dogs, so every now and then I'd give her one as a treat. When I did, I'd eat an apple or a pear myself as a part of our little ritual. One day when Sweetie and I were walking down by the flood wall, I admitted to her that I missed reaching out to others. Carla once said she knew she had fallen in love with me when I helped her mother, a woman I hardly knew at the time, after Carla's father died. But it's been so long since I've helped someone, sweetie. I wouldn't know how to get started. Bright and early the next morning, sweetie woke me up licking my face. When we took her little stroll down the street, she waddled like a baby hippo up to the neighbor John. I noticed he'd gotten up in years, and John got to talking to me about my new dog. And the next thing I knew, I was helping him change the oil on his old Lincoln and promising to help him pick apples and take the screens off his windows. That got me feeling so good that I started giving Carla a hand around the kitchen and making more of the household decisions. Before long, I was taking Ashley to her ball games at school. My therapist was proud when I told him I had accepted an invitation out to dinner with friends. Thanks to Sweetie, I was no longer retreating to a dark bedroom during family get-togethers either. All Sweetie wanted was to be next to me, and being with her was pure joy. Time stopped whenever I was with her, whenever it was going to the backyard, filling our birdhouses with Sweetie jumping with joy as the cardinals and doves or simply taking out the garbage. On Tuesday morning, Sweetie was with me all the way, step for step. Sweetie was so patient and caring. Qualities they I usually attributed to people, not dogs. Sometimes it seemed like she eavesdropped on conversations, then took the information she gleaned to encourage me. Because of that little by little, I opened my heart to the love that had been around me all along. People say I saved Sweetie's life, but I tell them, Sweetie saved mine. I later learned that Carla had asked God for a miracle so she could have her old husband back again, and that's exactly what he gave her. God sent a miracle in a form of the most unconditionally loving dog ever. So miracles come in all sizes and in all ways. And those are two stories about nature and animals that touch people's life in a miraculous way. Now I'd like to share a story about how miracles come to us through children. You know, they say out of the mouths of babes. Did you know the saying is derived from the scripture of Psalm 8, 12? You have taught children and infants to tell of your strength, silencing your enemies and all who oppose you. Often with their unquestioning faith and relentless honesty, children lead the way as we come Like children and shake away our silly unbelief, our eyes are open to see the hidden hand of God. 
And, you know, as we get older, we kind of lose our childlike spirits, and that's really sad. So reach deep down into yourself and find that childlike spirit. Your life will be a lot richer for it. Now I'd like to share the story with you that uh, is very touching, gives you food for thought. The title of the story is called Chill Alert by E.V. Sparrow. And when I read it, it gave me chills too. Kind of makes you think about things sometimes. <clears throat> Our picnic blanket was cozy on the grassy hill near the playground. Rachel and I had a perfect view of our young children enjoying themselves. Despite the warm days, chills ran up my limbs. I rubbed my arms and pulled up my knees. I located our girls playing with their dolls inside the fence. My son Colton rode his bike with training wheels. He raced as fast as his four-year-old legs could carry him him and pedal on the paved bike path around the outside of the fence. Rachel's son Jacob struggled on his bike to pass Colton. They laughed. I surveyed the park and the surrounding area. Everything looks fine. Two mothers with strollers sat on a bench as the far side of the fence. Three other young children played near the, our girls. Why do I feel so uneasy? Several yards behind us, a young man sat in the shade of a large elm tree, engrossed in a book. His backpack lay beside him. Beth Look at the girls. They're sending their dolls down the side. I love their sweet giggles. And getting sand everywhere, I chuckled. But chills tightened my scalp. I turned and glanced over my shoulder. Two men in old bay station wagon cruised past us. They circled the long parking lot before they returned to our area and parked behind our hill. The hair in the back of my neck bristled. That's odd. Chills scampered along my arms in contrast to my children's joyful laughter. Rachel sighed, I love the fenced-in area for the sand of the swings. It feels safe. What's there to be scared of? I watched my boys chase Jacob on the bike path. The bikes were a fun idea. I rested my chin against my shoulder and turned my sights on the men. Is God warning me about something with these chills? The passenger and driver sat immobile. Beth, look, the girls' dolls have sand all over them. It's in their hair, Rachel laughed. They sure having fun. I studied the men. The driver dressed in a tan shirt, cap, and pants exited his beige car. Tan men strode about 50 yards across the parking lot and entered the restroom. Beth, what are you looking at? Oh, some men parked behind us, I pointed over my shoulder. The driver got out and walked all the way across the lot to the restrooms. Why would you park over here? Who knows? Seconds later, the tan man exited the restroom and strolled to the end of the lot. You mean the man dressed in tan? Silly, it it is the bathroom, you know. Rachel pulled a bought a bottle out of her bag. It's warming up a bit. Yeah, I watched tan man disappear in the tall grasses along the creek beside the fence playground and the bike path where our boys played. Beth, are you still watching him? Where did he go now? He's searching for something by the creek. Maybe he lost his dog. Tan man emerged from the grasses and stopped to survey the park. Is he watching the kids and moms? Rachel turned her her head in his direction and pulled down her visor. I did see a lost dog poster on a telephone pole as we pulled in. Okay, but something is giving me goosebumps. There's another man in Tan Man's car. I don't trust these guys. You named him Tan Man? Rachel rose and looked past me. Yeah, he's just sitting there. But Beth, they could be on a lunch break. No one's been eating or drinking anything. Tan Man slid into the foliage along the creek and out of sight. Our kids played in the sunshine while Tan Man crept in the shadows. Rachel leaned back and studied the car. Did you notice they don't even have front license plates on that car? Yeah, that's really weird. The passengers still waited. My scalp crawled as I searched for Tan Man again and found him under the elm tree. Tan Man spoke to a reading man and waved his arm towards the playground area. Reading man glanced up and shook his head and returned to his book. 
What do you think, he asked him. I turned my sight to the area where our girls still played. When I looked back under the elm tree, Tan Man was gone. Maybe he asked about his dog. I don't see him anymore, anywhere. He's not at his car. Did he go under the bridge, Rachel pointed. I don't know. I lost him. The boys are coming our way. I rose to my knees. You watch for him and I'll watch the kids. Jacob tipped over on his bike at the turn halfway to the bridge, and he rested beside the path. Colton overtook Jacob and crossed the bridge going fast. Tan Man sprang out from under the bridge and sprinted full speed at my boy. Tan Man's face held the focus of a ravenous lion stalking its prey. <gasps> my boy! Colton was unaware of him. A rush of terror shoved me to my feet. I couldn't breathe. My bow is too far away. Help, God, help! Ice cold fear rushed through me. Rachel yelled, Jacob! Rage propelled me forward. My ears rang. No, I screamed. Colton, come now. Oh, God, make Colton obey. Colton's sweet baby face flashed through the, my mind. The feel of his arms around my neck. Help him, God. Fragmented thoughts pounded. The car is closer. He'll be gone. I changed direction toward the car while keeping my sights locked on my boy. Colton won his race, but he was about to lose his life in the grip of Tan Man's claws. Colton hopped off his bike and knocked it over. He sprinted toward me with a huge grin. The Tan Man tripped over the little bike with training wheels and froze in his tracks. He glared at us for a second. Then he fled from the park and jumped into his car and spun out. <gasps> oh, Rachel cried and watched the car as he exited the lot. I can't get the plates. They don't even have rear plates. I stood frozen. Then I sobbed and clapped my hands over my mouth. <gasps> Thank you, God. Waves of nausea rolled through me. My heart pounded while the ringing in my ears subsided. Colton, honey, come see Mama. Colton scrambled across the grass and hopped up and down. I won, Mama, I won. I'm thirsty. I got back sobs of relief and squeezed my son. Mama loves you so much. My heart still raced. I never, ever wanted to let him go. Colton squirmed. I'm thirsty, Mama. Do you want your milk? Yep, he nodded and followed me. I stroked Colton's perspiring head and poured milk into his cup with shaky hands. Thank you for saving my son from those men. I cringed and nausea washed through me when I thought about their evil plans. I took deep breaths. Colton wrapped his arm around my leg. I rubbed his back. Honey, you came right when I called you. Good job. Uh-huh. Colton looked up from his cup. His sweet, milk mustache face grunched in a smile. I dropped on my knees and kissed his cheek and held him tight. Colton never saw Tan Man. He didn't always hear or come when I called him. This time he obeyed. But what if he hadn't? If he wouldn't have been for God's persistent chill alert, the predator would have snatched him away. What if I was involved in conversation or preoccupied or never looked behind us? What if I ignored those chills? But with the grace of God, I did heed them. His supernatural presence warned me in a situation or I would have otherwise been relaxed and less attentive. Thank you, God, for his miraculous ways of reaching us. So that's an example of being with children and to always listen to your vibes. That woman was straight on and she saved her son. Thank you, God. Oh, my goodness, what a story that one was. So miracles come to us through different ways, through nature, through children, just all kinds of ways. And lots of times people think they're just coincidence, but there's a lot of miracles out there. We just have to look. The next story I'd like to share with you today is called An Easter Miracle by Diane M. Comp. Easter's just around the corner. So I thought this would be appropriate for today. The young couple watch as I examine their three-month-old baby at Yale New Haven Hospital, where I specialize in pediatric hematology, oncology, 
It was difficult to answer the question in their eyes of Susan and Barry Crumb, for I knew the statistics said their tiny Catherine was destined to die. Susan and Barry had already grieved over one lost child who died in infancy. Now their new baby suffered from the same disease, FEL, a genetic form of histocytosis, in which a type of bone marrow cell proliferates abnormally and destroys vital blood elements. Only one of every million babies is born with it. As a physician, I could not give the crumbs high hopes. To save this child, I would need a miracle. Children like Catherine had led me into pediatrics. I became deeply involved with patients, even making a lace-trimmed nightgown for one baby whose mother never visited. By time after time, I was taught by my young charges in endeavoring to help one boy facing a rugged test. I suggested he envision Jesus in the room with him. Think about Jesus, I said. I want you to imagine that Jesus is hugging you tightly. He looked up at me as if I were a little odd and said, But Jesus is already here. He knew the truth better than I. The test went smoothly. But Catherine was facing something far more perilous. There was one chance to save her life, but it was very slim. Finding a donor for bone marrow transplant? As a stopgap, we put her on chemotherapy. Catherine rallied under the treatment, cordling all of us with her delightful, toothless smile. I asked fellow doctors and nurses to write notes in the Book of Hope. I kept outside her door. As the staff struggled to record positive words, I saw a subtle, even hopeful progression in their notations on her medical chart. Together we joined in a daring hope that she might survive. She became an outpatient, coming in for three days of chemo every three weeks. The odds were faced and they were formidable. First, we had to find the right donor. So far, the only successful transplants in babies this year were the results of a brother or sister donor. But Catherine had no siblings. Hers would be the first unrelated transplantation in our hospital. Finding a match in time would be a major miracle. Six genetic elements must be exactly the same. No child has ever survived a partial match. If we found a suitable donor, we would then face the most excruciating risk of all. For seven days preceding the transplant, Catherine would have to be given doses of chemotherapy strong enough to destroy her own bone marrow, making way for the new cells. If after we started this chemo, the donor changed his or her mind, or the arrival of the donated marrow was delayed, Catherine would die. It was like shooting an arrow at her heart trusting that it would be blocked at the last moment. It demanded an incredible step of faith. We see no other way, Susan said, lifting her chin. She added, Barry and I know the odds, but we prayed for our child even before she was born. We trust the Lord. She picked up her daughter, who nestled her head on her mother's shoulder. She'll be in God's hands one way or another. We launched our search for a donor. I thank God for the altruistic loving people all over the world who have registered as bone marrow donors. They include doctors, secretaries, nurses, laborers, teachers, stay-at-home moms. We filed our requests through the International Registry of Donors. In the meantime, Catherine continued coming in for treatment. One month passed. Two, four, six. Catherine seemed to be hanging in there, but after a year, I began to worry. Catherine's blood was showing a rise in abnormal cells. As I bent to examine her, she waved a punchy hand and blessed me with her trusting smile. Then came the call we had waited for. Christine Ratcliffe, a 29-year-old mother of three who lived in England, had registered as a potential donor. Her bone marrow was a perfect match. A date was set for its harvesting in a London hospital, time to coincide with the schedule of a British Airways jet. One of our nurses, Hayne Peterson, would fly to London, pick up the marrow, and return the same day. Though there would be no turning back once the lethal chemotherapy was started, Susan and Barry were resolute. 
We didn't come this far to falter now, they said. So seven days before the marrow was to be harvested, Catherine began receiving the chemo. Poor little tyke. Now defenseless against common germs, she was isolated in protected plastic. Life Island. Her mother donned surgical garb to hold her. Catherine's mouth developed ulcers. She whimpered in her sleep and wanted to take her pain away. Each terrible day lumbered by like the slow tick of an old clock. By now, Catherine was almost 17 months old and had already survived much longer than expected. On March 9, 1992, Christine Radcliffe entered a London hospital where doctors aspirated the life-giving marrow from her hip bone. In America, we received the news. The harvesting had taken place. Hain had boarded the plane at Hebrew and was on her way home. The media headlined the dramatic news. History is being made today at Yale New Haven Hospital. We all kept up our prayers. So did Susan and Barry's church congregation as well as the prayer chains around the country that had joined in. At 6 o'clock that evening, we stood with TV news crews as a help had of Yale New Haven Hospital eagerly awaiting the helicopter that would bring Hain and her priceless harvest from John F. Kennedy International Airport. Finally, over a glimmering Long Island sound, a small speck appeared in the sunset. Then came the approaching chop-chop of the rotor blades. The helicopter settled on the landing pad before us, and Hain jubilantly stepped out carrying the precious marrow. It was rushed to the bone marrow of transplantation unit. Suspended above Catherine in a clear plastic pouch, the bone marrow looked like dark red blood, which some of it was. Her parents stood there quiet with awe. The tubes were connected, and like a blood transfusion, the infusion began. As the marrow entered the baby's veins, we knew that life-giving cells would find their way into the baby's own marrow, in a way we had yet to fully understand. I thought of the promised song, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made, Marvelous are thy works. It was over in a few hours. Now came an anxious time of waiting to see if those new marrow cells would start making new ones. Catherine's mother and father were by her side practically every waking moment. Blood sample after sample was tested. Hallelujah! On the first day of spring, March 20th, Catherine's blood counts indicated new life. The gracious gift had been accepted in record time. Now the little girl could defend herself against infection. The Tuesday after Easter, Susan Crum entered her daughter's life island for the first time without a mask, gloves, or a gown. Catherine stood up and clapped her hands with glee. Her mother dressed her in a flowered Easter flock, white bonnet and gloves and slippers, and a color-coordinated pacifier. The baby paused before a mirror to admire herself, and holding her parents' hands, walked out the door. As I watched her toddle down the hall, I remember how her innocent faith had never wavered. Again, I was reminded that it is not we grown-ups who lead the children home, but these little ones who lead us instead. That is so true. Little children... So much wisdom comes through them, and they're so young. So thank you to our authors today for sharing those beautiful stories of miracles. I think the last time that I made a podcast, um, I think a month ago or maybe two months ago, I shared with you some insights from uh, the story of the book written by Richard Carlson, Ph.D. called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff because it's all small stuff. And it's about simple ways to keep little things from taking over your life. So before I close today, I'd like to share a few more of those with you that you can take with you on your daily journey. Now the first one today is Don't Interrupt Others. I'll finish our sentences. It wasn't until a few years ago that I realized how often I interrupt others and or finish their sentences. We know, all know people like that, don't we? Shortly thereafter, I also realized how destructive this habit was. 
not only to the respect and love I receive from others, but also for the tremendous amount of energy it takes to try to be in two heads at once. Think about it for a moment. When you're in a hurry, someone along interrupt someone or finishes a her sentence, you have to keep track not only of your own thoughts, but of those of the person you're interrupting as well. This tendency, which by the way is extremely common in busy people, encourages both parties to speed up their speech and their thinking. This in turn makes both people nervous and irritable and annoyed. It's downright exhausting. It's also the cause of many arguments. Because if there's one thing almost everyone resents, it's someone else who doesn't listen to what they're saying. And how can you really listen to what someone else is saying when you're speaking for that person? Once you begin noticing yourself interrupting others, you'll see the insidious tendency is nothing more than innocent habit that has become visible to you. This is good news because it means that all you really have to do is to begin catching yourself when you forget. Remind yourself before a conversation begins, if possible, to be patient and wait. Tell yourself to allow the other person to finish speaking before you take your turn. You'll notice right away how much the interactions with the people in your life will improve as a direct result of this simple act. The people you communicate with will feel much more relaxed when they're around you, when they feel they, that you've heard and listened to them. You'll also notice how much more relaxed you feel when you stop interrupting others. Your heart and pulse rates will slow down, and you'll begin to enjoy your conversations rather than rush through them. This is an easy way to become a more relaxed, loving person. Well, that's some really good advice there. Now, the next one he shared with us was, do something nice for someone else and don't tell anybody about it. I love doing that. Have you ever done that before? Then you watch what happens. And that's your secret. They never know it was you that did it. It's so much fun. You get to try it sometime if you have never done it before. While many of us frequently do nice things for others, we almost certainly mention it, our acts of kindness to someone else, secretly seeking their approval. When we share our own niceness or generosity with someone else, it makes us feel like we are thoughtful people. It reminds us of how nice we are and how deserving we are of kindness. While all acts of kindness are, are inherently wonderful, there is something even more magical about doing something thoughtful but mentioning it to no one ever. You always feel good when you give it to others. Rather than diluting the positive feelings by telling others about your own kindness, by keeping it to yourself, you get to retain all the positive feelings. It's really true that one should give for the sake of giving, not to receive something in return. This is precisely what you do, and you're doing when you don't mention your kindness to others. Your rewards are the warm feelings that come from the act of giving. The next time you do something really nice for someone else, keep it to yourself and reveal an abundant joy of giving. And it really is a lot of fun. So if you've never done that before, do something nice for somebody else, but don't let them know you did it. And the good feelings that you get back are wonderful. You don't have to tell anybody else about it. It's just fun to watch the person you do this for. And the final one I want to share today is that let others have the glory. There is something magical that happens through the human spirit, a sense of calm that comes over you when you cease needing all the attention directed toward yourself and instead of it, allow others to have the glory. Our need for excessive attention is the ego-centered part of us that says, look at me, I'm special. My story is more interesting than yours. It's that voice inside of us that may not come right out and say it, but that wants to believe that, my accomplishments are slightly more important than yours. The ego is the part of us that wants to be seen, heard, and respected, considered special, often at the expense of someone else. It's the part of us that interrupts someone else's story or impatiently waits his turn to speak so that he can bring the conversation and attention back to himself. To varying degrees, most of us engage in this habit, much to our own detriment. When you immediately dive in and bring the conversation back toward you, you can subsequently minimize the joy that person has in sharing. 
In doing so, create distance between yourself and others. Everyone loses. The next time someone tells you a story or shares an accomplishment with you, notice your tendency to say something about yourself in response. Although it is a difficult habit to break, it's not only enjoyable, but actually peaceful to have the quiet confidence to be able to surrender your need for attention and instead share in the joy of someone else's glory, rather than jumping right in and saying, Once I did the same thing, or guess what I did today? Bite your tongue and notice what happens. Just say, That's wonderful. Uh, Please tell me more. And leave it at that. The person you are speaking to will have so much more fun and because you are so much more present, because you are listening so carefully, he or she won't feel in competition with you. The result will be that the person will feel more relaxed around you, making him or her more confident as well as more interesting. You too will feel more relaxed because you won't be on the edge of your seat waiting for your turn. (laughs) Obviously, there are many times when it's absolutely appropriate to exchange experience back and forth and to share in the glory and attention rather than giving it all away. I'm referring here to the compulsive need to grab it from others. Ironically, when you surrender your need to hog the glory, the attention you use to need from other people is replaced by a quiet inner confidence that is derived from letting others have it. (laughs) That is so true. So those little thoughts of wisdom from our, our author, Richard Carlson. What a wonderful man he was. He passed away several years ago uh, from, um, I think, in a book caught. He was only in his 40s, so he was taken away too soon. He had a lot of wisdom for such a young man. But this book is wonderful, so if you ever get out to uh, the library or to the bookstore and you want to read it on your own, it's called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. It's all small stuff. And again, the author is Richard Carlson, Ph.D., Thank you so much for joining me on my podcast today, Life Treasures and Golden Moments. I hope you all have a beautiful week, and I look forward to being with you again next month. So until next time, take care and God bless. This is Natalie Silver with Life Treasures and Golden Moments. Thank you.